Hello class, welcome to the next and final segment in lecture 14. And in this final segment, we are going to bring everything we talked about earlier, earlier in this lecture together and take a look at uh, how what we talked about leads to the formation of the jet streams that we observe in the atmosphere. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So hopefully this diagram looks familiar. This is what we introduced when we were talking about the Hadley circulation. So you remember, remember we have this wind that's blowing from the equator. Again, this is at the tropopause level. This is aloft, not near ground level. So you remember, remember we have this air that's blowing from south to north, or I should say equatorward poleward, which in the northern hemisphere that would be from south to north. And then it undergoes a Coriolis deflection as it's trying to go northward. So you have this air that's all trying to go towards the east. Now, the astute student might be wondering, well, hold on a second. You also have return flow that's moving from north to south in the mid-latitudes. So why doesn't that oppose this flow from 0 degrees north to 30 degrees north in the tropical regions? It turns out the southerly flow in the mid-latitudes is much weaker compared to this large-scale flow pattern that takes place. So this easterly component of the wind actually tends to dominate. And as in the process, this wind all tends to come together and form forms what is referred to as the subtropical jet, which is a current of relatively fast air, which can be found at a latitude of roughly 30 degrees north. And here we're looking at this from a purely conceptual standpoint. And some of your later meteorology classes, you will actually explore this in much greater detail and get into some of the mathematics behind the formation of the jet streams that we're going to introduce. And one thing that might also be worth pointing out is the subtropical jet, there's two main jets in the atmosphere. One is the subtropical jet, which we're looking at right now, and the other one's the polar jet, which we'll look at in just a few minutes. But between the two of them, the subtropical jet tends to be the weaker of the two jets. So the polar jet tends to be much stronger than the subtropical jet. Uh, subtropical jet, usually you have a westerly wind in the neighborhood of 30 to 60 knots. Usually doesn't get more much more intense than that, but the polar jet that thing can pack a punch. That thing can get 100 knots, 150 knots. Even in some extreme cases, it can be 200 knots up in the up at 60 degrees north, which is where the polar jet is found. But let's actually go ahead and take a look at the mechanism behind the polar jet. So you may remember from the previous segments how we talked about how at 60 degrees north you have relatively warm air, and at 90 degrees north you have relatively cold air. So that's going to result in a temperature gradient. And uh, we also showed that you have this flow that's going from the pole down towards 60 degrees north. So you have a wind that's blowing from the north to the south. So again, warmer air, colder air, and you have this wind that's blowing from the colder air to the warmer air. So if you look at these isobars, which are the lines, uh, the dashed red lines here, as the wind blows from the colder air to the warmer air, you can sort of imagine how these isotherms, I think I said isobars, these are isotherms, the red dashed lines, you can sort of imagine how as the wind blows from the colder air to the warmer air, these isotherms are going to be uh, getting packed tighter together. And we'll talk about this uh, little in a later lecture when we talk about frontogenesis. We'll look at this in some greater depth. But it turns out that you get a pattern, a temperature pattern that looks like this. So you have this really tight thermal gradient or this really tight temperature gradient, which is present at around 60 degrees north. And that's due to the flow pattern and also the temperature imbalances that are present between 60 degrees north and 90 degrees north. But we also showed that from the thermal wind relationship, if you've got a temperature gradient in the atmosphere, then you must have some sort of vertical wind shear. And it turns out the thermal wind relationship, if you work through the mathematics of it, you can show that this thermal gradient is actually responsible for the strong westerly flow as you go up in the atmosphere. And it doesn't increase instantaneously. As you go up in the atmosphere, the westerly component of the wind gets stronger and stronger with height because of the orientation of this temperature gradient near the surface and uh, also due to the, and uh, also just due to the, the fact that, that you can sort of think of how you, the, the, the zonal component of the wind is basically zero here. It's just moving from north to south. So in the, as we'll see later on, We'll actually substantiate this when we talk more about jets. As you go in, as you go upward, the wind wants to go more and more in the direction of the thermal wind vector. And if you use the right-hand rule here, you will get a thermal wind vector that points from west to east. So that means as I go up in the atmosphere, that means the wind wants to go more west to east, and that also means the wind wants to intensify if it can. So if the flow is already zero at ground level as I go up, 
let's say I might have a west to east wind of 30 knots, then I might have a west to east wind of 60 knots. Then as I go higher and higher, I might have a west to east wind of 100 knots, 120 knots, and it'll increase as we continue going up into the troposphere until you hit the stratosphere and then the thermal gradient kind of goes away and you don't have the wind stops increasing with height. It actually goes the opposite direction in the stratosphere. But the thermal wind relationship, it can be used to explain why we have this strong westerly winds increasing with height, and that in fact does lead to the formation of the polar jet. And this thermal gradient that appears here is also got its own special name. It's called the polar front. And this will be something that you talk about also in some of your upper division dynamics classes, but uh, polar front is formed in these in this region because of the general circul the global circulation pattern that is the polar cell or the polar circulation. So we have the polar jet, which typically hangs out around 60 degrees north, and the subtropical jet, which typically hangs out around 30 degrees north. And again, between the two of these jets, the polar jet is by far the stronger of the two. But the other thing that the other interesting thing, thing that happens with the polar jet is because it's dependent on the temperature gradient at ground level, we'll take a look at this from a more global perspective. Because it's dependent on the temperature gradient at ground level, that means the polar jet can, the shape of the polar jet is easier to change. Excuse me. So think about how, excuse me again. So think about how you have colder air trying to go southward and warmer air trying to go north, northward. So you're going to start producing sort of a wave pattern in your thermal gradient, which is also going to give you a wave pattern in your polar jet. And sometimes in the extreme cases, the polar jet and the subtropical jet can actually combine. So the wind pattern can actually make it, on some occasions, can actually make it all the way down to the polar jet, in which case uh, the two jets almost become indistinguishable. You can't really tell which jet is which. But uh, this polar jet, by f is uh, because it's based in the thermal wind relationship is based on the temperature gradient at ground level. If you start moving colder air southward and warmer air northward, you're going to start changing the orientation of that thermal gradient. So you're going to start changing the orientation of the polar jet. And again, sometimes the polar jet can experience a pretty extreme uh, dips and rises as the temperature, especially in the spring and winter months, uh, you can see some pretty insane uh, polar jet structures in those months. And uh, if you get a really good polar jet in the spring, then you might be talking about a potential severe weather event. But uh, again, I just want to sort of emphasize subtropical jet doesn't really vary much. Uh, it tends to stay pretty straight. It has some fluctuations in the north-south direction every now and then. But the polar jet, that's the one that typically has the significant fluctuations. It has that wavy pattern that can make it fluctuate uh, in the north direction and the south direction. And sometimes Again, it can reach that polar jet can reach all the way down to where the subtropical jet is, or it can go all the way up to a latitude of 90 degrees north in some extreme cases. So that's going to do it for lecture 14, a look at the global pattern and how that leads to the formation of the two main jet streams. And well, before I wrap this up, one last thing to note, you could also do this for the southern hemisphere. So the southern hemisphere also has its own subtropical jet and its own polar jet, which behaves in a similar fashion. Although the polar jet in the southern hemisphere doesn't behave as wildly, and that has to do with the fact that the southern hemisphere doesn't have that many mountain ranges. Well, that's one reason why. But that'll be a topic that you talk about in greater depth when you get into some of your upper division classes in your senior year. So uh, for now, that's going to do it for global circulation and the jet structure in the atmosphere. So uh, with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.